Ask Mapped, episode 126. It is I, Ryan Gray, back again from vacation, uh, joined by two amazing members of the Map slash medical school headquarters team, co-founder at Mapped, Rachel Grubbs. How are you today? I am excellent. I'm super excited. We have so much going on today. It's just, it's a big day in the Mapped and medical school headquarters world. So I'm pumped. It is a big, big day. And Courtney Lewis, former director of admissions at Burrell College of Osteopathic Medicine, now an amazing expert advisor here on the medical school headquarters team. How are you today, my friend? I'm doing well. Excited about the Black Friday deals and everything that's going on because I'm ready to start advising on mass here with MAPT and med school headquarters. And I'm hoping that you're going to work in your vacation into the responses to every question because yes. I'm so jealous yeah. that you got to go to the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I forgot that's, that's your bucket list vacation. Yes, it's, um, it's the top place that I would love to go to. So if you can work in some details just to help us with FOMO, that'd be great. <laughs> yes, I, I will let you know right off the bat it was paradise. Good. I'm I'm happy to hear that and that it wasn't. Yes. A letdown. It was not a letdown. Not at all. Not at all. The bucket list then. Yes. Um, if you are watching us live, you can ask your questions. Go over to mapped.tv. Ask your questions over there. Uh, and if you want to work with Courtney throughout this application cycle, we're starting our Black Friday Cyber Monday sales early, as in right now. Uh, 20% off all of our advising, uh, all of our one-on-one -on -one advising. So application cycle prep, uh, mock interviews, essay editing, all of that fun stuff. You can go check it out at uh, medicalschoolhq.net is where all of the advising lives now. So stay tuned for that. All right. Um, and that also includes Application Academy. To save $100 off Application Academy. Um uh, again, using that promo code, thank you 100, or there's another promo code to save um, on the installments as well. Yeah, but they automatically apply. So the, the promo codes are automatically applied if you just go over to medicalschoolhq.net right now. Yep. Awesome sauce. Do we have any questions lined up? What do we got? Alex asks Hello, I have my first upcoming MMI interview. That's like saying, VIN number. My first MMI. I know the MMIs are mostly scenario-based. Should I also be prepared for personal questions, such as why medicine, why this program, etc.? Yes. Yes. Courtney, I, I don't think you, you didn't do an MMI uh, at your school, but were you familiar with the MMI and, and what schools were doing elsewhere? Yeah. I, As you said, I didn't run them personally, but there was a lot of discussion amongst the, the deans and directors of admissions across the nation on what they were asking, how they were running it, how many stations they would have, who was conducting the interview and, and mixing in, um, you know, potentially different people than just the faculty. So familiar with it. I always think it's a good thing to prepare to be asked, why medicine? Why do you want to be a physician? Why do you want to come here um, and, and be able to speak to those? I think it's, it's smart to prep for that. Yeah, a station could literally be <laughs> walk in and talk about why you want to be a doctor. That that for eight minutes. So so know why you want to because if you have a very succinct kind of general answer, you're not able to give any some concrete information. It'll it'll probably come off not as strong as it could. David, hello. I know consistency is king. I love it. But what do you think about reducing consistency if you have too many hours? I have 25,000 clinical hours and want to attend university full time, plus shadowing, etc. Rachel, 25,000 hours. David, uh, David wants to go to school. Yeah, I, I think that's great. If I mean, I don't think you can have too much clinical, but... Um, <laughs> I think there's a big plus in going to university full time if you can afford it in terms of both the tuition and just the way you manage your time and 
you know, if you're lucky enough to not need a full-time job to, to subsist, um, because med school is basically full-time, so it's good practice. That said, I've known lots and lots of career changers who have gotten into med school after attending university part-time, so I don't want you to think it's a requirement. But yeah, if you can swing it, I think that's wonderful. Um, the one thing I'll say, and I'm not downing you, David, just you know, so for you, but for anyone listening, is sometimes when people tell me they have 25,000 hours, it turns out that they like unintentionally padded like, you know, if you work 40 hours a week for a year, that's about 2000 hours. So maybe you have 12 years of full time experience or maybe some of your clinical was in the military. And so you're counting 24 hours a day, but actually you shouldn't because sleeping doesn't count. Um, or like someone once and again, I'm not saying it to you, but someone once told me she had been doing it for five years. So she rounded up to 10,000 hours. And then when I talked to her, it was a summer only job. And I was like, oh. So three months a year, not 12. <laughs> you know, so I just want to double check that your 25,000 is right. But again, I'm not worried about too much. It's more like if you've got plenty, then maybe you can dial down to just volunteering a couple hours a week or a month just to keep your finger in clinical for the consistency. And then, yeah, do school full time if you can. Yes. John, are publications from, quote, predatory journals or, quote, borderline predatory journals better than no publications at all? I know research isn't required for med school, but just curious about this. So, John, my question for you is, what is a predatory journal? Uh, is there a, a known list out there of what that is? Uh, I think it's the ones that make you pay to be published. Yeah. I, to, to, Courtney, as a former director of admissions, do you know what the predatory journals are? I have not heard this term before. And so I'm a bit unsure um, what they mean. I would anticipate that research publications are a good thing yeah. on, on the reg. But, um, but if there is a known issue amongst scientists that I just happen to be unfamiliar with, for for these then i guess be thoughtful about it yeah yeah don't, but if, don't. if you've done it give yourself credit for it though i mean it's it's published research so yeah yeah so what what rachel said uh there potentially are journals out there that are charging for publications that they basically um and, and there's some public database out there i don't know where it is where it'll tell you like this specific journal will accept only a tenth of the articles that are submitted or whatever it is. And so the journals that accept everyone, eh, you have to be careful uh, about those ones. So, yeah, I, I, I want to know why John's asking the question. He's like, can I game the system somehow? And, and will they catch me? Yeah, I would always err on, on being thorough and honest with your application yeah. and yeah. letting the cards fall there. Well, and just keeping in mind that research is not validated by a publication in this context because it could be a 10-year project and you're in a key part of it for three years and then you apply to med school right so I just it, it seems like you John you've already said you understand that research isn't always required but this is secondary like publication is not a required part of research for pre-meds you know you're not a professor who's publisher parish that's not that's not what's happening with you you're just getting exposure to research that is true william when you say medical schools look at trends are they looking at individual courses or are they looking at overall gpa trend yes yes <laughs> yes <laughs> anything and everything that can be trended they can look at it all they can look at your science trend they can look at your chemistry trend they can look at your whatever trend Course load. Last six months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All of it. See, there's this thing. Um, it's called the internet. And, and since we got the internet, we don't have to look at transcripts on little pieces of paper anymore. So we can like put all these numbers in a big spreadsheet and then we can calculate them in lots of ways. Yeah. And med schools have also discovered this technology. <laughs> <laughs> Heavily utilized. <laughs> Rosanna, I became 
my little brother and sister's guardian at 18 freshman in college got some f's and withdrawals that i made up with repeated courses i got a's in well i get a chance to explain those grades so potentially a good time to mention uh that amcas uh it's not public knowledge yet but and i got and rachel i didn't tell you this i got a phone call from someone yesterday going where did you get that information <laughs> i um, wondered i was like it's not public and yet it's been discussed publicly so maybe a better word is it's not official <laughs> yeah but it is official it's just not it's just not um announced yet it's been released yes that's right it's been released to some parties but students yeah haven't been that party <laughs> yes so unannounced changes uh from the double amc with amcas they are re uh i don't know the right word revamping revamping maybe they're they're quote unquote getting rid of the disadvantaged essay but they're not getting rid of the disadvantaged essay they're recategorizing it uh and, and i don't have it directly in front of me at this time uh, but they're they're basically redoing it as a is there anything else you want to tell us? Very similar to the TMDSAS extra essay. And I think this would be the perfect spot for that to go in. It would have fit perfectly fine in a disadvantaged essay as well. But now with this other information kind of um, essay that is replacing the disadvantaged essay, students are going to have a much easier time understanding oh, my story fits here uh, without asking, can I mark myself as disadvantaged? Which was the question we got all of the time. So for TMDSES and AMCAS, yes, you'll, you'll have a great opportunity to write about those. For Comus, there really isn't a great spot to write about anything like that other than secondary essays if schools have a good yeah. essay prompt for that. Um, Ted asks, assuming I have ample patient care and shadowing hours, is volunteering at an animal shelter acceptable? It's something I could really see myself talking passionately about in apps or interviews. <sighs> Courtney, what do you think? Have, have you seen any vets turned doctors that have lots of this experience? I do have, um, I have seen quite a few applications for people that foster animals or, or volunteer at animal shelters, and they just count it under their community volunteer hours. And so I think that this would definitely be categorized there. And um, if it's something that you want to do, that's good. I think that is perfectly acceptable. You know, make sure that you do have the ample patient care and shadowing hours, but this is totally fine to put, and it falls under the community volunteer hours. I have lots of or animal loving med students, and and people had active rover accounts and fostering and time at the shelter, um, so it's a good thing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, and the the specific term for that new essay is other impactful experiences. Impactful. That's the. That's the term that's replacing the disadvantaged status. What will be interesting is I don't know if they're making it a mandatory or optional essay. Yeah. That'll be interesting to see. It doesn't say. We'll find out. Jordan asks, I'm taking biostatistics, reproductive biology, and cancer biology in the microbiology department of the public health program. Can I put these classes under BCPM, even though it's a public health master's program? Most likely, yes. All right. Uh, this comes up all the time with the course classification guides from AMCAS, from ACOMIS, from TMDSAS, with uh, a class that is classified under, let's say, uh, um, biology, but it's not a biology class. It's writing about biology. That's a writing class. That's an English class. But students are like, but it's labeled bio. And I'm like, that doesn't matter. You have to use your brain and think critically, like, what is this class? What does the syllabus say? That's how AMCAS, that's how all of these application services are looking at these courses. It's not just how is it classified in terms of is it bio? Is it uh, a public health course classification? But what is the actual class? 
So mm -hmm. most likely those are going to classify. And, and they really do look into that when they're categorizing. I know when they're doing the GPA calculations and you enter it and part of the verification process is them digging into that. So some likely these of your public health will count towards your science GPA and others will not. And I definitely did see that in, in the calculations. Yeah. Hey, but I took dual credit in high school through community college. That GPA was good. However, my freshman year at a four year was a mess strictly focused on science courses. Is there still hope? Siempre, siempre hope. Always, right? Always hope. Easy answer. That's what we we're talking about those trends earlier. Yep. That's easy. <laughs> Jolie, if we reapply for next cycle, do we need to redo essays from our primary application and our secondary application? Rachel. I mean, I think you should at least consider it. So Jolie, what I always recommend for someone who is going to reapply is to assess everything in your application and then make some decisions about what you're changing. And, you know, you can do that on your own with your own good judgment. You can watch a bunch of application renovations and am I readies for free on YouTube. Those are series we have on our mapped and med school HQ YouTube channels, or you can buy a single session of advising with us and we'll do one professionally with you one-on-one -on -one in private. Um, but what you need to do is consider all of the parts, right? So, you know, was it my grades? Was it my MCAT? Was it when I actually submitted? Maybe my primary was late. Maybe I took a long time to get my secondaries back. Um, if you got a ton of interviews and you know you choked in all the interviews, then maybe it wasn't your essays. But usually when people come to me with this kind of question, they got no interviews or one or two interviews, which says to me, maybe there is something we can strengthen. And I think a lot of people focus on the stats, the numbers. Like I, I often hear, you know, oh, I have a 3.5 and an MCAT of 508, so I'm going to take a master's. I'm like, why? <laughs> you know, like, can we talk? I mean, maybe there's a good reason. Maybe there's a master's you're really passionate about. Um, but, um, but I want people to think more critically. And I think essays are often overlooked. Um, you know, Courtney here can speak to this firsthand, but if you think about the experience of the admissions committee reader, you know, when they get to your personal statement, or often, at least with the AMCAS, they often look at activities first and then personal statement, uh, although they, they can look at it in order they want. Um, so they've, they've done 30 already that day, and they have 20 more to go after you. So is this going to be one more essay that reads like a resume or reads like I'm just desperately trying to impress you? Or are your essays going to be that breath of fresh air that sounds authentic and personal and you understand this is not a school essay, this is a personal statement. So it reads differently, it should be genuine, it should be sincere, it should talk about patient care experiences and not just like the thing that happened in your own family that probably sparked your interest, right? And it, if those things are a mess, then like that's a, it's a big thing you could fix that you might not realize. So a long way of saying, maybe, I would at least check out the possibility of redoing them. <laughs> Jasmine, hello all. I recall Dr. Wright mentioning that online courses from schools like Berkeley Extension are acceptable. Does this apply to continuous enrollment courses, i.e. complete mm -hmm. at your own pace? Courtney, thoughts? <sighs> Are they acceptable? Yes. Most of the time I would say so. Um, normally the feedback I would receive from faculty members and it's been discussed beyond just the borders of the med school I was at um, was that online courses weren't the most favorable for your prerequisites, especially those that include a lab where there should have been a hands-on component and some FaceTime with the professor. So if it's a must, 
I would say a majority of schools, not all, but a majority of schools will still accept it. But if you have the opportunity to take it in person, I think that's widely considered the most favorable option if it's a possibility. William Beck, I looked online for my dream schools. They have high average or median GPA is like around a 3.8. Is there median GPA? What does that mean? Is that science GPA, all other GPA, or overall undergrad GPA? So let's do uh, a quick little rundown, specifically with the MSAR, because that's where most students go. That contains all of the MD school information including Texas, um, the MSAR has median GPA and median MCAT scores. Now, median, by definition, is what is the middle. So if you have uh, three students in the class, one has a 3.2, one has a 3.5, one has a 4.0, the median is a 3.5 because uh, that's just how it works. There's no math involved. You just go right to the middle and go, you're the middle, and, and that's the number. So... On the MSAR, they have median overall GPA and median science GPA. So it's, it's just going to depend on what number you're looking at. Now, remember, that means half the class is above that number and half the class is below that number. So what does that mean? Nothing. <laughs> it means, means nothing. It's just the number. Um, that's just what the number is. So does that mean you shouldn't apply if you don't have that number? Not at all. Um, the MSAR does include 10th percentile numbers. So 10% of the class being above that or below that number, 90% of the class being above that number. That potentially is a better indicator of what your chances are. But again, 10% of the class is below that number. Now, what is 10%? If it's 200 students, 10% is going to be 20 students. So could you be one of the 20 that's below that number? Sure, why not? If, if that's your dream school, apply. And, and let them tell you no. And just to kind of add the ACOMA side of this, on Choose DO Explorer, you can pull up the osteopathic schools and you can see the last class uh, stats for matriculating averages or means. And so that will inform you kind of the same way. We don't have the 90-10 split, but it'll show you the matriculating average. Um, online, you can also find how many applications they received on their institutional website, uh, what prior classes, not just last year, look like and where they're matriculating from. So all of that information is also available for osteopathic schools, either on the institutional website, usually they post it in a snapshot, or on Choose DO. Yeah, I think the big takeaway here is, uh, I mean, William, you'd asked about, is it science or other, or all, all over undergrad? It's probably all over undergrad and post back because that's usually, usually when med schools say cumulative GPA, that's what they mean is undergrad and post back. Um, not always, but usually. Um, but basically take median with a boulder of salt. Too many people hear median or hear average. So hear median or mean, and then internalize minimum. And that is not correct. <laughs> there's only a minimum if the med school explicitly says on their website, there's a minimum and not that many do. Man toes, as opposed to woman toes. <laughs> as opposed to lady fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Would three biomedical publications, two first author, really improve my application? No. Some say this is an X factor. I'm passionate about research and got lucky with good mentorship from my PI. All right. If, if there's a school that really loves research and they, they love that part of it, it's going to depend on who's reviewing your application and what, uh, what they fancy. I, I think the immediate question, if you do make it to an interview, is why you don't want to pursue just a PhD. Why medicine? Why do you want patient care? Why do you have to be a physician specifically um, if you have a predominant um, kind of focus on research yeah. in your undergrad or grad? I think that that's going to be an immediate go-to of why physician, why working with patients. So make sure that you are very clear 
uh, about the distinction and why you're choosing the path that you're choosing in your essays so that they will understand that. But anticipate that question if you make it to an interview as well, which um, you're, you're going to have to explain that part. Yeah, it could be a red flag. <laughs> it could go both ways. Rosanna, can y'all talk about changes coming for Application Academy? I think I remember Dr. Ray mentioning something about having the Academy be year round. Yeah, let's talk about Application Academy. So historically, the, the prior two cohorts of Application Academy started in January. We ended in October. And we are moving to a system where, uh, and, and with those prior two cohorts, you could only join, you couldn't join past February, basically. So if you're like, okay, I'm done with the MCAT in March, you're like, I want to join, you couldn't. We wouldn't let you. Uh, and so we're changing it to help more people. And because we've figured out better processes and more improvements, and we have a bigger team now, uh, and we're utilizing TAs, which is amazing. And so we're going to go year round, two classes a day, live sessions a day uh, with, um, modules that are pre-recorded so you can go watch some content then come to office hours and learn about what it is that you're doing whether it's it's um uh secondary essays activity essays personal statements you come submit stuff have it reviewed in class potentially uh ask questions whatever that may be practice your interviews so rachel's showing off the uh the new website with kind of what it looks like there's a kind of a um, proposed schedule on there as well. Application on. Academy is going to be fun. Can I just interject here? I was shocked. I, I sat in on a number of the Application Academies and ran a few towards the end since I'm relatively new. I was shocked by how much value there <laughs> was in, in Application Academy to pre-med students. It's, um, you know, you're there we talk through your essays, you hear other people's essays, you guys give peer reviews, either verbally or in chat. And we have, you know, relatively small classes. So you're getting a lot of time with advisors, with Ryan, with Rachel, and also your peers and being able to ask questions and bounce ideas off of each other and go through each of the components of the cycle in your application and then do mock interviews and get feedback real time on that, I was very surprised <laughs> that 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 was out there. And I don't think a lot of people understand how much you get from attending these things and, and being able to be just with some peers that are going through the same process and, and hearing what they have to say and what they wrote as well. It's, it's just, I was just surprised and I wanted to share that. I think <laughs> it's a really good thing for people to join. And I'm not trying to push a sale. I just think that there is a lot of value in all of the feedback that we receive internally from students who've attended Application Academy just really have wonderful things to say about it. And I'm, I'm not surprised. So anyways. Yeah. Just... No, I love that. I mean, because you are relatively newer to the company, it's like, it's wonderful to have that perspective. Um, and for me, what is, was really joyful about Academy this year was the community. And I know there was a great community the first year. So this will be going into our third year now, um, but I wasn't as directly involved. And so, you know, some of the TAs this year were telling me about how amazing the community was the first year. And so we worked to foster that, or like the TAs and I decided, okay, the students have that the first year, we're gonna make sure to create that same safe space. So you get kind of vulnerable when you're talking about personal statements and activities. and. The environment was a really good mix of traditional and non-traditional. We had people from 19 to 59, people all across the gender spectrum, people with different needs, different niches. So there was like an overall group that was really supportive and loving. Like we gave each other honest, constructive feedback, but also always in a you can do it way, never in like a judgy competitive way. And then what I also noticed is lots of little niches formed, right? Like there were so many non-treads that there was sort of like a 20 something and a 30 something and a 40 something subgroup. And, you know, there were people like, who's applying early? Like, let's all meet together sometimes. And lots of little unofficial sessions happened because people made friends. It was just really beautiful to watch. So beautiful. <laughs> 
Collaboration, not competition. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So we're excited. Yes. And we may have MCAT prep coming to Application Academy. That's maybe it's on we're, some versions of the schedule. <laughs> we're, we're working. We're working on it. So yeah, go to applicationacademy.com, friends. Check it out. Yes. Uh, Zaying, I am applying next cycle. And big part of my app is on my medical missions abroad to Ghana and Colombia. Does this actually stand out to committees or is subjective to each school? Subjective to each school. And could be a red flag. Goes right back to the red flag thing of like, what were you doing over there? And uh, were you doing things that you shouldn't have done? I, I think the general answer to all of these questions is it's going to depend on who's reading your application. It's going to depend on the school and what they're looking for. And understand that you're not the first person that's gone on medical mission trips. They've seen it before. They're going to see it again. It's what did you take away from it? How are you going to write about it? How it, it impacted you? How you impacted it? That's, that's what it comes down to. Courtney, anything to add there? Yeah, I... It's fairly common to see this as part of an experience. Um, what I would caution you on is how many hours you count towards it, as Rachel was saying earlier. Even though you're there, how much are you actually working? What are the actual clinic hours that you need to represent so it doesn't look overinflated? Sometimes I would see numbers and I would go, you know, you would need to be there for, you know, one week longer if you actually accomplish those numbers. So be thoughtful about that because we do look for inflation of uh, the hours that you present. And then if this is a predominant part of your application, I would, I would think that they would also want to see some shadowing or clinic experience within the U.S. as well. Um, this could be done over time. It doesn't have to be done in mass, but just don't have, I, I would suggest not having only these two as your clinical experience. They're kind of isolated incidents. And so um, those would be my, my two kind of takeaways or tips for that to just have a stronger, more ideal application um, clinical experience that you're reporting. Yeah. I'll chime in one other thing. So um, Zane, this may not be as specific to you because you've done these missions abroad already, but for anyone else considering them, like we said, they don't have to be bad. They can be good. Um, I recommend that you look for missions that are trying to go and build new infrastructure rather than swooping in to save, right? So for example, it used to be that a lot of plastic surgeons would fly to um, developing countries and do surgeries there for people and then fly home again. And that's great, right? I mean, it was a wonderful way to donate their time and expertise but it doesn't fix the problem that there's a shortage of physicians with that surgery expertise in those countries, right? So just think about, am I doing this so I can feel good? Or am I doing this because I'm trying to make the, help the folks that need this help, help themselves, right? It's that old um, adage of like, do you, do you give the man the fish or you teach him how to fish? Um, so I would just advise that you're, you're joining programs that are trying to teach how to fish. Turf, should I not apply to schools with small class sizes, even if I'm fitting their mission? <laughs> Why? Why? Yeah. I think we're a bit perplexed by this question. <laughs> Turf, I feel like you have a real question behind that question, and we don't know what your real question is. There's yeah. some assumption baked in here that we're not getting. Yeah. What's the QBQ, as they say? Um. I mean, one thing I guess you may want to look at, even if you fit their mission, is if they recruit and matriculate predominantly in-state students, um, which may be a little bit harder if you're coming from out of state, but it doesn't completely rule you out. So if you're a good mission fit, um, I would think that you would want to give yourself the opportunity, you know, to, to apply. All medical schools are going to have really, really, really low acceptance rates. That's just part of the game, right? It's like 2 to 4% basically for an acceptance rate to medical school. If you look at individual schools, the number of applications that they take and the number of, of acceptances that they hand out. 
And you remember the number of acceptances is typically more than the number of seats that they have because they're they're playing a game and students that they accept will won't come. They'll go to another school. And so acceptances may be a little bit higher than than you expect unless they give uh, specific acceptance percentages. So every medical school is going to have a really low acceptance rate. My assumption, Turth, is that you're basically saying, well, their acceptance rate is going to be even lower. Not really, because they only have a certain number of seats. So they're not going to get three, like a ton more applications uh, for those number of seats. Just, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what this question is supposed to, to ask. Yeah. I mean, some of the more competitive med schools are very large, right? So it just, it, there's not a correlation there. John, I got an MIP my freshman year buying beer. I'm assuming that's an institutional action. I don't know what MIP means. Minor Dumb in possession. Oh, minor, minor in possession. Uh, so not an institutional <laughs> action. Well, it may be an institutional action or it may be an actual um, misdemeanor. Yeah, yeah, misdemeanor. So dumb mistake that I've learned from since, number one, if I... Uh, if the charge was dropped, do I still need to note it as a misdemeanor on my app? Oh, yeah. If I kept reading, I would have understood. Uh, number two, how much does this hurt my application? Courtney, is John the first person who has ever said, I'm 18 in college. I'm going to have some beer now. Did you see how quickly I answered <laughs> for that abbreviation? I have seen it. Yeah. Um, it is, I mean we can call a spade a spade here. It's not a favorable thing to have on your application, but you do absolutely want to be honest. There are questions that ask about criminal charges or sanctions that you've received. Unless it's been completely expunged and it no longer exists, I would say report it because we do run very thorough background checks as we are getting ready to matriculate those that we've offered acceptances to. And so if it comes up, then you run the risk of a seat being rescinded because you falsified information and things like that. So you can reach out to the school for more clarification if you want, but I would err on the side of always reporting, being truthful and upfront about it. Usually if there has been a period of time in between the charge and where you're at now as a person, we understand some of the college mentality and, you know, it's, it's going to depend a little bit on the screeners or an admissions committee, but most of the time a misdemeanor isn't a complete rule out. However, if you falsify or if you put blame on somebody else in the little description that you can give, that is also not favorable. That shows that you didn't learn anything from it. You're not taking ownership over the mistake that you were part of or made on your own. And so um, you need to be very thoughtful about this. But um, unless it's been completely erased, we're going to see it anyways. So you should report it. Yeah. And, and the language here is important. Right. It comes down to I've done a couple episodes with a lawyer who deals a lot with this. Go look those up. I think uh, 199 or 201 is one of them. If you just look up Larry Cohen Medical School HQ dot net. Um, if, if the charge was dropped to me, you weren't convicted. Right. Because they didn't charge you if it was dropped. And so you didn't go through the whole process. You potentially were still arrested but then the charge was dropped. So the language of the question is really important because some questions may ask, were you ever arrested? Well, yes, I was. And then you talk about how you weren't convicted, the charge was dropped or whatever. If it talks about ever being convicted of a misdemeanor, then the answer is probably no because the charges were dropped, so you weren't convicted. So the, the nuance of the language here is very important. Yes, it, it will make a difference there. And some states are ban the box where you don't have to report certain things. And I know that's been part of the discussion. However, this is not a job application. This is for medical school. And it, most of the time, those things, you know, I know in Texas, if you get a speeding ticket, it is a misdemeanor. And so it's very unfortunate that that's kind of how it is. But they did still have to report it. So um, just be very thoughtful. And yes, I would say follow the wording because that will always be in the safe, safe zone. 
You're muted, Rachel. I was just going to chime in that sometimes they say misdemeanor with moral turpitude, right? So like in a case like Texas, you know, five, five miles over the speed limit is usually not considered moral turpitude. If you're going 130 to 70, then yeah, you're endangering everyone around you and you probably did get that ding. So yeah, it's, it's just about the fine print. And unfortunately, talking to your counsel, right? This is not a, not a thing where you say, I don't need a lawyer. Like, yeah, you do. I'm, I'm sorry, because it's, it's a ton of money, but you got to talk to your lawyer. Throw away. That's not a very good account. <laughs> Any insight of sending a letter of intent to schools that really want them, Georgetown, Mayo, et cetera. Can you change your mind? Let's say if you receive a better scholarship from a different school. Well, then I would probably say you shouldn't send a letter of intent to that school because you don't really want to go there. You're just looking for what's best for your wallet, potentially. <laughs> now we know why they picked a throwaway account. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I want to go to your school <laughs> with an asterisk. <laughs> yes, I, I, I am uh, given the right to uh, um, change my mind. Uh, yeah. I like those people on Tinder who like book seven dates on the same night and then last minute decide which six they're going to stand up. <laughs> Is that from personal experience? I don't. I, know. I should yeah, be shocked that that that's to someone. Me. Yeah, that's <laughs> oh, wild world out there. Yeah. <laughs> Courtney, did you like getting letters of intent? Did you ever get them? Sometimes. Yeah. Um, I think that they can be helpful to know if somebody is still interested, especially when you are getting a little bit later in the cycle and you're going to have to start looking at your wait list. Um, if you've already gotten an acceptance, I don't really need to have a letter of intent, at least, you know, my process that, that wasn't necessary. Um, but I think if... If you can provide valuable information and, and you're genuine about it, it's a good thing to send in. I would, you know, make sure that the school is accepting them. You named ones that did want to see it. So it's not a bad thing, but I would say I'm in alignment with you, Ryan, where do it if it's genuine. <laughs> um, if you're just fishing for any and all acceptances, you you may already have an idea of that and, and you'll still be able to make that choice with or without the letter. Gonzalo, I have an upcoming interview with an MD school that heavily emphasizes research in their mission, but I only have 50 hours of research and my uh, main, how should I, on my main, I'm assuming, uh, whatever. Maybe application. Yeah. Uh, how should I approach this interview? Gonzalo, you have an interview. That means they like you. This is one of the confusing things, right? That a, a medical school... It, as part of their mission, can be heavily involved in research. That doesn't mean they're only looking for students who have research experience. They're looking for students who are interested potentially in doing research and understand that they're applying to a school that wants to do a lot of research. And do you have things in your application that show that you're going to be excited about that research? You have an interview. Throw this concern out the window. They may ask you, what are your research interests? I doubt they're going to say, why do you only have 50 hours of research? Yep. You've already hurtled past so many thousands of other applicants that um, receiving an interview, because we just, we don't have time to interview everybody. So we cut it down to maybe a couple hundred. And so you've already made it to that point. So obviously this was acceptable. I would say you need to be able to talk in detail about the research that you have done, if you're going to notate it in your application, they may ask you questions about it and you you want to be able to discuss it a bit more in depth if they do ask that. But yep. that's really what you should prepare for is being able to speak to the research that you have done or any interests that you may have in the future, maybe something that's going on at that particular school that you would love to be involved in something. Mm -hmm. Trevor, I have a 3.3 overall GPA, 2.9 science GPA, but with an upward trend ending in a 4.0 as a senior taking PCHEM and other upper division courses. Would you recommend a post -bac or MCAT first? So, Rachel, when you look at this, it mm -hmm. doesn't tell us a lot still. 
No, because the first thing I think is you didn't tell me how many credits your upward trend is. And Trevor, I don't mean that you have to type in right now because that still might be enough. Not not might be enough. But what we're not like, I understand you're scared, right? Because there's a mythical 3.0 line and you're it's mythical, but you're afraid I'm under that line and therefore no school's gonna want me. Um, but what we don't know is do you have that GPA because you had one horrible semester and then you have been doing really well since, or is it something where you've been up and down and all over the place in your science courses consistently? Let me turn on screen share here. Maybe we'll hide Trevor's question. So if you guys look here at this uh, example student who we've, cleverly named Upward Demo. So I guess you kind of know where this story is going. I asked for that name, by the way, I'm making fun of myself. Um, so the blue line here is cumulative. So if you just look at the blue line, the student had, and again, it's just an example, a really rough first semester. Cum never fully recovers, right? It's, I mean, it's much better, but 3.42, it's, it's never gonna be a super, super high GPA just because that's how cumes work. But now if I just look at the green line, I can see, okay, there were a couple rough semesters, but since summer of 2020, this person's been rocking almost exclusively a 4.0. And if I look with in the details, yeah, with a lot of credits. Um, and if I come here to the detail, I can actually see the credit count. So this is the cum. I'm gonna skip it and go to class standing. And I'm actually going to scroll down because what I really want to look at is class standing science, since that's what you asked about. So now I can see, okay, there were about 17 plus 19. So what's that? 36. 36 credits of like B and C work in science is the first two years. But junior year and senior year, 46 credits, right? Yep. 46 credits of nearly straight A work. Right. So now what I see with this example student is that whatever troubles they had with sciences their first two years, they figured out. And I haven't gone and looked at the exact course detail yet. And then as an ad com, I might. But already I'm starting to think, well, they struggled with the prereqs, but then something got right. And as they got into upper level division sciences, their grades actually got better. So now I'm less worried about the 2.97 GPA science cum. Um, you know, in your example, in this one, it's 3.44, because I see the student they are today is not the student they were four years ago. And that's what we can't answer with your question, because we don't know that detail, which is why you should fill out a math account. Uh, so, so he did add a bit more information. He said he had a couple of hard months, uh, sophomore and junior year, okay. um, because of some situations that were going on. So with that being a bit more recent, you haven't had much time to be on that upward trend. So it may be beneficial um, to look into a post-bac um, program and, and give yourself a better foundation maybe before going in to start medical school because it's not just about raising your GPA, it's about um, being as well prepared as you can to start the pace and the amount and the content of medical school that you're going to encounter as soon as you get going. So um, with these being somewhat recent, um, it may be beneficial if you could take that, but not necessarily a must. But we get, we get the same level of detail, I would say, as what you'll see in MAPT. We get those kind of breakdowns on your application and more. Um, we can do it by uh, category of the types of courses. So how many microbiology and all of its variations have you taken? How many OCHEM classes? How many um, you know, of your non-science? So we get very thorough breakdowns of anything and everything having to do with your academics and charts and, um, you know, divided by year, by subject, by category, by credit hours. So we'll be able to look at that in totality. You have something that can kind of justify why you had a rough GPA during that time. So, you know, in the essay that we were saying um, is going to be most likely available, you'll be able to address that for this time period and, and maybe provide some justification for it. But, um, you know, if there's things that you can do to improve your foundation and would make you better prepared, it wouldn't 
it wouldn't harm it and it would show more of an upward trend over time and um, make this appear as more of an isolated incident. But Cool. So yeah, just while we're talking about mapped a little bit and showing off map, there was a ticker going there at the bottom. Maybe we can bring it back for just one more moment. So uh, we talked about early Black Friday deals before. We didn't mention that also applies to MAP. So uh, MAP is always free, but there is a MAP Pro, which is an even more robust. So everything that we've already just shown you in the last couple minutes, all that is at the free level. But if you also want the ability to log in and chat with mapped MSQ advisors. So Ryan, me, uh, Courtney, Verinia, Scott, the same people that do the one-on-one -on -one advising, we're here answering messages for people who are members of the Map Pro level. And pretty soon there's gonna be another really cool feature being added to Map Pro, which is our uh, My LORs, our letter of rec portal is coming this winter. And that is gonna be an amazing value. No more um, Interfolio, right in mapped. Yeah. Talk about the LOR a little bit, or is that what you, all you've got to say about that for now? <laughs> uh, I mean, go pretty soon, you'll be able to start requesting letters of recommendations from your professors, uh, mentors, PIs, doctors, whoever. Yeah. Uh, request them right inside of Mapped. Uh, they'll be able to submit directly to Mapped, and then Mapped will send them to the application service, just as Interfolio works now. But we'll be better because it'll be very much pre-med specific or pre-health specific as we continue to move forward with all the other pre-health fields. So uh, we'll yeah. be able to give a lot more information, helping letter writers write better letters for you, help you understand the letter process much better all right inside of mapped and we're going to have mapped uh with this early black friday deal you can get a whole year's access for 60 dollars. i don't know exactly i think interfolio is somewhere on 50 right now so for 10 dollars more you get everything interfolio gives you plus all the cool stuff i showed you in map with activities and gpa and prereqs and school research plus the messaging with advisors like if, if you're looking for um end of year gift giving ideas for people who love you uh, a $60 map subscription before the sale ends in two weeks. That's my suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> Being able to chat with us all the time for a full year for $60 plus the LORs plus all of the trends and mapping all of that out and prepping your experience. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I know. I always think how many students um, reach out to me and say like, well, you know, I tried to talk to the schools that rejected me and most of them just said they were sorry, they just didn't have the time. Like every once in a while, someone will get lucky and get some, here's why we rejected you feedback, here's what you work on. But, you know, thousands and thousands of applicants, they can't do it for everyone. But here at MAPT, we have two former directors of admissions. So maybe they can't say specifically what the admissions committee members were thinking because they weren't in their heads, but got a pretty good idea. <laughs> I have a, a pretty good idea. Yeah. of the discussions going on. <laughs> we could probably identify what it was, but yeah. but that's why we all joined, right? Every, this is a small company, but this is what drew all of us to want to join together and mm -hmm. share that information and provide accessibility and insight. So it's yeah. fun. Uh, all right, one last plug, Ryan. How to intrigue medical schools and get an acceptance without needing perfect stats. Yeah. I'll give you a better website, premedworkshop.com. Oh, yeah. That should be premedworkshop.com. Premedworkshop.com. Um, yeah. So doing – it's my, my favorite workshop doing tonight. Um, just talking about storytelling and how to use your story to intrigue medical schools. Because ultimately, at the end of the day – all right, Courtney, you, you see thousands of applications. You're like, which one is just going to pique my interest a little bit more than the rest? And so how do we, how do, we do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go there. 9 o'clock Eastern tonight, and then I'll do another one tomorrow as well at, I think, 1 Eastern? 1 p.m. Eastern, yeah. yeah. So same workshop, two days. Uh, check it out. Yeah, and this is a once-a-year thing. You tend tonight, you tend tomorrow. There's a recording available for, what, a week? And then that's it. So no FOMO. Come hang out with us tonight. Yeah. It's better if you're applying. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, better if you're applying in May. Yeah. All right. I think that is it. Our hour has come and gone. It goes fast when we're here hanging out, having fun, answering your questions. Courtney Lewis, former director of admissions, Rachel Grubbs, MCAT expert for lots of years. Um, if you want to work with Courtney, uh, more specifically, Courtney, uh, we have 20% off early Black Friday sales of all of our one-on-one -on -one advising services. Just go to medicalschoolhq.net. It is .net.com, as Courtney learned recently. Um, <laughs> .net. Um, maybe one day we'll get the .com. Um, yeah, go go check it out. The Those deals end at the end of the month, near the end of the month. So. Cool. All right, everyone. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you again next week. Indeed.